the bursting of the nation's housing bubble adds up to a subpar Major shake up on Wall Street. Lehman Brothers has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The mortgage crisis and the government takeover of mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Alan Greenspan calls it a once in a century financial crisis. Meltdown on Wall Street, the worst since 9 11. One giant collapses, another is bought. President's yet. economic generals warning Congress approve a $700 billion bailout or face dire consequences. The outlook for the economy and thus for credit quality remains uncertain. I have talked to the heads of almost every single one of these firms in the last 72 hours and he has no idea what it's like out there. None! Yes, I found a flaw. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. Welcome to New York City, financial capital world. Welcome to Wall Street. This is uh, the heart of American capitalism. Before I begin, a few things about the tour. One is, uh, I'm not used to the camera in front of me. One is, uh, uh, let's make this tour interactive. Feel free to ask me questions. One of the things I love the most is uh, you guys getting the aha moment. If you can walk away today with a better understanding of Wall Street, better understanding of the financial crisis, I've done my job, all right? Committee will please come to order. I will uh, start the questioning. Dr. Uh, Greenspan, I want to start with you. And my question for you is simple. Uh, were you wrong? Uh, it would be sure the mic is turned on. Uh, partially, but uh, let's separate this problem into its component parts. We're talking about explaining history, major world historic events. This is as much a wealth crisis as a debt crisis. It's a problem of wages as much as investment. It's a debt crisis, but it's also very much a crisis of economic theory. I think the income distribution was the initial step in the dynamic that drove the debt crisis. It's horrifying. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, all the people that we trusted have turned out to be completely untrustworthy. This crisis is a total failure of markets. So it's not simple. In a short span of time, between March 2008 to September 2008, so many things happened. Fear was, was in the marketplace. And so I want to tell you, in six months, three of the top investment banks would fail. And they would tell you the top U.S. insurance company would fail. And they'd tell you Fetty and Franny, top mortgage issuers, bankrupt. Oh, Iceland, bankrupt. Bank runs around the world. If someone would tell you this would happen in a short six months, you think they're crazy. But that's essentially what happened. Dr. Greenspan, you had an ideology. You had a belief that, um, that free competitive markets are by far the unrivaled way to organize economies. We've tried regulation, none meaningfully worked. That was your quote. Do you feel that your ideology pushed you to make decisions that 
you wish you had not made? Well, remember that what an ideology is, is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to, you, to exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. And what I'm saying to you is yes, I found a flaw. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. You so found a flaw in a the flaw, reality? A flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. It wasn't so long ago in the history of man's voyage toward a better world that ships were carrying eager passengers toward the shores of a new nation that was just in the building. Our forefathers were constructing the foundation of this nation by interlocking inseparably the blocks of our political and economic freedom. In some sense, economics, standard economics, is a very optimistic view of human nature, right? Everybody's wonderful. Everybody's great. Every person is a perfect calculator. And that's basically what it means, is that we have lots of actors, each of them doing the best thing for them, and that creates some kind of social uh, benefit for everybody. The way of life our forefathers established on this foundation of freedoms drew people from the far corners of the earth. And all those who set foot on these shores had the opportunity to build a better life for themselves. Even young Jonathan, an unskilled lad from across the sea, hoped to find a job where he could progress according to his ability and enterprise. Well, there's many factors that ultimately underlie the current financial crisis, but uh, one thing that comes across in my mind is the intellectual change. An idea, yeah, an idea. In the 1970s, the so-called efficient markets hypothesis began to be received doctrine uh, in the universities. The simple version of the efficient market hypothesis is that you have a value of something in the market, whatever it is. If it's too low, people would recognize it, and then it would bid the price up. If it's too high, people would recognize it and it'll bid the price low. So you might have one opinion, I might have the other opinion, but the opinion of all of us in average is going to be kind of the correct opinion, what's called the wisdom of crowd. This is the hypothesis that all financial asset prices are correct at all times. Well, correct in the sense that they accumulate all of the information, uh, pool the information, and then become wiser than any one individual, uh, so that it would be foolhardy to ever question a market price. While the Main Street of today doesn't look much like the Main Street of Jonathan's time, the principles of our business system remain the same but businessmen still compete with one another for the consumer's supply of spendable dollars. And Mrs. Consumer is still mighty critical of everything she buys. So under that thesis, prices are always at the correct price. And you can't have an asset price bubble in the efficient market hypothesis. So let me uh, tell you a bit more about myself. After MIT, I went to Silicon Valley and so I was there before the bubble, during the bubble, and slightly after the bubble, the internet bubble, that is. And so, you know, after the bubble, I was like looking around, I was like, wow, you know, what I'm doing is really risky. I gotta find something more stable. What I became is I became a bond trader of essentially subprime mortgages bonds. I think we know what a bubble is. It's a phenomenon that has been repeated many times in history. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, I think it says something like, a uh, speculative price increase that's not justified is filled with air like a bubble and eventually bursts. Economists would like to come up with a good explanation. Why did we have a stock market bubble in the 1990s and then a real estate bubble in the 2000s?
I like to give explanations that sound a little, that sound right to me and maybe a little disreputable in our own profession, uh, and they're cultural explanations. What, one thing that strikes me as having f been very formative for people's thinking was the explosion of capitalism. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. It started with the Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan revolutions that brought free markets to more prominence. And then it moved on with the breakup of the Soviet Union. The advent of capitalism in China. It seemed like there was an intellectual revolution that people believed in markets. And so people thought that we're in a new world. Private property reigns. It struck a tone of fear in people that I better get on this or I will be left behind. I would call it a gold rush mentality. And it led to people changing their self-image. They thought that I have to change to become part of this, to be smart and stay uh, afloat in this world. I'm going to be an investment genius. Play your hand at hotjobs.com. Dot com. Dot com. It looked like the dot com, the, all those tech stocks were a great way to invest your money, and so money flooded in. Today I'm talking to some city pets. Ooh, ooh, hey, poodles! Did you know that pets.com delivers food, treats, and toys? And lo and behold, you can't make money selling pet food on the internet. But people thought it was this new opportunity for investment. Doctor, I think you should see this. Oh my. Why, what is it? He's got money coming out the wazoo. What do we have? Money out the wazoo. Move this man to a private room. It's time for E-Trade. Unfortunately, we were embarrassed by the fall in stock prices. So we had to turn to some way of uh, maintaining the ego uh, <laughs> that we had just developed. <laughs> We started to think we had a smart response called sector rotation. Rotate out of the, that's a little bit of jargon. <laughs> Rotate out of the equity sector into the property sector. Introducing the world's fastest money-making system, John Alexander's Real Estate Riches in 14 Days. It accelerated largely through media, television shows that focused on the bubble and ad campaigns that reinforced notions that seemed to support the bubble. Wouldn't you like to learn how to make a fortune in real estate without needing any money? People were so pleased that they had found the smart at-home investment that they understood and knew and, and they were very confident about. There's no reason that you can't be living the same life I am in no time at all. It's humiliating. I am an economics correspondent for the New York Times, and I'm 10 months past due and in extended discussions with the lender. I'm kind of amazed, actually, that I'm still in this house. That deal that I got is not a good deal, and I cannot keep the house with this deal. All the bad mortgage you can ever imagine in this planet, that's the kind of mortgage I have. I'm a, I'm a working stiff. I'm a regular guy. I have a job. I'm trying to get ahead. And I thought this was a, a smart way to do it. Here's how it started for me. I got married six years ago, and about a year into our marriage, my wife was staying at home and decided, now I want to do something. So she looked around and thought she'd try to sell real estate. And she took the course, passed the test, went to work for a pretty large Century 21 office in our area. And uh, the broker there, that was, that was maybe two years into the boom. And he said to her, he said, I would recommend everybody that owns a house borrow as much as you can against it, take out every nickel that you can, and invest it in real estate. You just can't lose. You can always tell, can't you? A town with good real estate people is a more substantial community. 
Because more people own their own homes. That's right. You could look at a house that was two years ago 300,000, now there's 600,000. They're just astronomical. And you see it happening all around you. Everybody's getting in on it. So I'd been in my house 12 years or something like that, and I'd built up equity. And I thought, wow, he's right, I should do that. So that's what I did. The efficient market hypothesis is built on the simple idea that as the price of a good goes up, we tend to demand less of it. So the supply and demand matches. That's what gives us the stability in the system. If you imagine, for example, something like a refrigerator, if its price rises dramatically, people are going to make do with the refrigerator they've already got. When they start to treat a good as a financial asset, as people started to do with houses in the, in the boom, that's when you get into a very unstable market. Asset markets are dramatically less stable than goods markets. You don't see the price of Chevrolets skyrocket and then plunge. The key difference between an asset and a good is when you buy a good, you want to use it. You're not going to resell it. When you're buying an asset, you're buying it in the hope of being able to sell it in the future for a higher price. So if we see that its price is rising, we then tell ourselves that we're very smart and we go out and buy some more of that asset. So in goods markets, when prices rise, demand falls. In asset markets, when prices rise, demand often rises as well. In the asset market, uh, the very fact of its having grown in price fuels demand for uh, additional purchases of the asset. It also fuels additional purchasing power because people can borrow more against the value of the assets they own that went up in price. Most of these assets are bought financed with debt. We buy a house, we buy it with a mortgage, so it's debt financed. If one of those assets goes up, you're able to borrow more money against that asset. So your spending power for new assets rises as the prices go up. I bought several investment properties. I'd buy one and I'd, I'd, I took equity out of my house, or I'd buy one and then go look at another one, take equity from the one I just bought in order to buy as much as I could. I bought at exactly the wrong time. I wanted a buying spree right at the peak. In fact, the most expensive property I bought in Hawaii is still today the highest price in that development three and a half years later. I was the peak. I had to buy around the peak. I was the highest one. Immediately after that, the next one was less. How does that make you feel? Great. <laughs> Dr. Greenspan, your view of the world, your ideology was not right. It was that, not that, working. That is, it had a, that precisely. No, I, that's precisely the reason I was shocked, because I had been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. Greenspan had been working to the assumption that the financial system was a self-stabilizing system. It meant that he took a view of asset price bubbles, which was that uh, it really wasn't in his uh, remit to do anything about them. He had this idea that the central bank should never question asset prices. It should only take action when asset prices started to fall. So whenever there was the tiniest slowdown, 
he'd be leaping in with monetary stimulus, cutting interest rates and trying to boost activity again. And of course, boosting economic activity is just a euphemism for trying to encourage the economy to borrow even more. Creating a credit boom or a credit bubble. So we're in this crisis in large part because our central banks have, for the last two or three decades, encouraged us to borrow more and more and more and uh, eventually got us into this unsustainable state. Now, if the central bank's operating its interest rate policy in a way to encourage asset prices to keep inflating, obviously that's going to benefit that portion of society that owns assets, which is typically the wealthy end of, of the spectrum already. In 1900, many men had to work 10 hours a day, six days a week, to earn enough money to provide their families with the bare essentials. Hand labor was the rule in the home as well as the factory. A half century later, we had invested enough in our business system to provide the average worker with efficient and expensive buildings and machinery to enable him to produce enough in a 40-hour week to earn twice as much as the 1900 worker earned in a 60-hour week. This shorter work week gives us all more leisure time to enjoy a standard of living beyond the wildest dreams of anyone who lived a half century ago. The more we earn, the more our families have to spend for the things they need and want. You ask an American, when was America most prosperous in the 20th century? Most Americans, outside of financiers and Wall Street, will tell you the 1950s. There, it's thought of as this time of perfection, this golden age of capitalism with big fin cars and houses, and anybody, any guy, could get a job and support his wife and kids and this kind of lifestyle isn't possible for most people today. And fortunately, we have been able to raise our standard of living without sacrificing the spiritual side of life, which means so much to the American family. Now, this is also the moment in America that has the least income inequality in our history. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Before the sort of World War II period, income inequality was very high. The share of total American income going to just the top 1% peaked in 1929 at about 22%, which is an extraordinary figure. And then as you go into World War II, income inequality falls from 1945 to 1970. In the 1970s, the top 1% were getting only 9%. That was a huge fall. And then in the 1970s, you start to see it rise again, accelerating in the 1980s. There's been a big shift in the way income growth has occurred in the United States, certainly, but also in other countries as well, though not to the same degree. What we've seen is that unlike the three decades right after World War II when incomes grew at about the same rate for everyone, starting in the early 70s roughly, income growth started accumulating only at the top. The share of the top 1% went shooting up like a July the 4th skyrocket back up to about the same as in 1929. And partly that can be explained by the credit boom or the credit bubble. You were OK up to that credit business. Couldn't you make that a bit clearer? To really understand it, you have to go back to the 1920s. There was increasing uh, inequality, but there was also increasing debt. The U.S. 
was um, developing great productive capacity in consumer goods industries, such as refrigerators, such as radios, such as automobiles. And these were very expensive for the average worker at the time. And so over the mid-20s uh, to late 20s, there's an incredible explosion of installment credit in America. People could borrow to pay for all the new modern electric appliances. And you had a rapid rise in credit in the economy to the point at which we got too much credit, too much indebtedness, and then eventually the system collapsed. So the 1920s can actually be seen as a kind of precursor of what happened in the 2000s. So you have a very pronounced U-shaped curve, just as we have seen happening with income distribution. And that's because economic activity, profit growth, and credit creation are all intimately linked. Ah, yes, dear lady. High, high quality at a low, low price. If the banks are more willing to lend, it becomes easier for companies or for households to spend because they can borrow money and they can then spend it. Sales dollars from satisfied customers once again flow back. So as credit rises, corporate profits rise. The remainder of the profit is paid out as dividends. Well, who tends to own the shares in the corporates and the shares in the bank? Generally, it's the wealthier people that, that own the capital stock of an economy. So if profitability is being boosted, then there's a natural tendency uh, to polarize wealth distribution within the economy as well. That's a symptom of a credit cycle. Say, that sure was a neat job. That building across is the most important building of Wall Street. That building is the uh, House of Morgan building. That's where J.P. Morgan's original bank was. The institutions that are going to make the most profit from that credit creation process are, of course, the banks. Every time a loan is made, they take a margin on it. Every time a bond is traded, they take a margin on that as well. So the credit bubble creates a system where you boost financial profitability more than profitability in the rest of the economy. So if there's a boost to profitability for the banking sector, it tends to drop quite quickly through to pay for bankers, through to the bonuses. <laughs> Here we go. I think the compensation strategy that we've had for many years uh, is in line with best practices to encourage long-term incentives. The closer you are to the money, the more of it you make. If I took any, anybody and I paid them $10 million for their job, I took you and I started paying you $10 million for your job, in two weeks you will think you'll deserve it. I'm looking forward to my next billion. We want to we wanna hire and retain the smartest people in the world. And so we have to offer them uh, incentives uh, which can compete with, with those that are trying to attract the best and smartest people in the world too. You know, we just want one thing from Wall Street. We'd like them to be able to do the math. That's all we want. We just want them to be able to do arithmetic. And they got it completely wrong. If they were that good, we wouldn't have been in this mess. All right, so uh, our next stop is going to be Deutsche Bank, where I used to work. All right? So it's been an enormous pyramiding of income and wealth in the last 30 years. If you look at the people in the top decile, uh, the lion's share of the growth that occurred there was in the top 1%.
slice that up and you'll see the lion's share of the growth in the top 1% occurring in the top one-tenth of 1% and so on as far as we've managed to go up and, and find data to check. Everybody else, uh, this new inequality um, meant a bunch of things. Only a business operating at a steady profit can give its workers security and From World War II until about 1970, wages grew very steadily. There was a widespread, well-paid manufacturing economy, good steel work, good car work. High wages and steady employment. All this changed after 1970 with the double whammies of the rise of globalization and deindustrialization beginning to hit the American workforce. Through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the bottom 90% of the American population was getting roughly 65% of national income. That share fell to about 50% in the last few years. Adjusted for inflation, the median wages stagnated from the early 1970s, except for a small blip in the early 90s, till today. Well, there are certainly primary residences here in, in West Hampton Beach, but for the most part, they're secondary. Some of these homes are third and fourth homes for, for some of the people here. You can certainly get a small cottage here somewhere in 500000 to a million dollars, but, but the lower end properties are rare and you generally need to really put some money into them to make them livable. With that said, you can certainly afford a house here around 900,000 all the way up to 10, 12, 20 million. Uh, so depending on uh, how much money you have in your back pocket. So we're about two weeks away from being complete. Um, homeowners taking possession in about two weeks time. Stunning. Uh, right now, thank you. Um, right now we're just doing a final punch list and walk through and uh, final touch-ups as, as you can see. Uh, great raised panel detail, um, custom kitchens. It's really coming along amazingly. Right. Thank you. The gentleman who bought the house is, uh, is a chief operating officer of a hedge fund in Manhattan. This is their summer home here in the Hamptons. They have another home up in uh, Westchester, upper New York. Here's your home audio um, control four system. Again, he, he's able to control the house uh, anywhere in the country, or anywhere in the world, as a matter of fact. It used to be that more was better, more was more was more impressive, more was everything. I think what we have in West Hampton Beach is what most people are looking for, which is simpler. It used to be the 10,000, 15,000 square foot house had to be. Today, the, the, that smart money is, is saying, I want to simplify my life. People are, are keen to want to scale down. That's what West Hampton Beach offers to people. It offers them a simpler life. Do I need the 17,000 square foot home? Or really can I survive with the 8,000 square foot 8, home? And it's foot. not, it's, it's, you know, there's plenty here. There's, and you still get here. the Hampton address, so.
As you go up the income distribution scale, what people spend their money on changes. So that consumer goods relatively decrease, housing increases a lot, but then when you get to the finally to the top of the economy, they're spending most of their money on assets rather than manufactured goods. And so this upwards income redistribution in itself tends to ignite asset bubbles. That, that process of, of income distribution created a bidding for houses indirectly. Uh, the, the people at the top of the income ladder buy mansions. Uh, people in the middle don't seem offended by that in America. Uh, they want to see pictures of the mansions. But uh, what does happen is that when the people at the top build bigger, their bigger houses shift the frame of reference for people who are near them in the income distribution. People have a lot of money, but not quite at the top. So you get a cascade one stage at a time that drifts down through the income distribution. The median family now, if it wants to buy the median priced new house for its area, it's got to buy one that's now 2,400 square feet uh, in size. In 1970, it was about 1,600 square feet. So 50% larger house you have to buy if you want to match the spending of people at your income level. If you're in the middle, well, maybe you shouldn't because you don't have any more money. You can't afford that house. But then you say, well, if I don't match the spending of people in my area, it'll be my kids who go to the inferior schools because there's a very tight link between how good the schools are in the area and how much the houses cost. So it's really a dilemma for the, the family in the middle. Oh, I, I don't know what to do, Jenny. I want that house so bad I can taste it. Maybe we ought to wait. And wait. My and colleague, wait. Carl Case, and I, we wanted to find out what were the dynamics of home prices. And there was surprisingly little academic or scholarly literature on it. Someone would publish a paper in, you know, 1953 or something, and then it would just be forgotten. I find them in dusty volumes. And I thought, well, I'll link them together. So I created for the United States a home price index from 1890 to the present. And when I corrected these for inflation, consumer price index inflation, to my surprise, there was no increase in home prices from 1890 to 1990. It was just the same. And then there was this huge bubble in the U.S. starting in 2000. And uh, that was the only one. Savers and homeowners are capitalists. They've worked and saved to make the biggest single purchase in their lifetimes. They have a share of America's wealth. They've seen capitalism work, and they've made it work at home and in their own communities. On the one hand, you have home buyers struggling to make ends meet, looking for the only way they know how to make money in our economy. They can't make money through their labor, so, but maybe they can make it through buying a house and seeing the value of that house increase. So people look to mortgages, these easy-to-get mortgages, as a way to finally get their share of the American dream. And on the other hand, uh, the income inequality produced a ready supply of capital at the top to be invested as well in these kinds of mortgages. So while the top was not willing to pay the bottom wages, they were willing to lend them money. In a typical city or town, on a typical residential street, we find a typical home occupied by a typical American family. Like millions of his fellow Americans, John Q. Public earns enough money to keep up the payments on a new car. He takes great pride in owning a fine, new, long-term mortgaged home. 
that was built to last a lifetime. The way in which mortgages have been sold has changed tremendously over the 20th century. Sign right here. Mm. Mind if I read it first? In the 1920s, there were a variety of ways to borrow for a mortgage. Things that seem as though they were just invented a few years ago were actually commonplace, like balloon mortgages or interest-only mortgages for houses. Thousands of people get a big thrill out of looking at model houses, and a much bigger thrill when they buy one. They could be amortized or unamortized. They could be three years. They could be 10 years. Model house now. Suppose we follow them. The husband apparently isn't very keen about it all, but you know how wives are. So they would borrow some large fraction of the house and then refinance it in three to five years. So part of what causes the mortgage crisis of the Great Depression is that suddenly, not just that everyone lost their job, because a lot of people obviously lost their job, but that investors fled the mortgage investment market. So in response to this, the federal government developed the FHA. the Federal Housing Administration. Do you know how far your pay will go in buying a house? It may surprise you to learn that you can become a homeowner even on a small salary with the National Housing Act insured mortgage. The FHA standardized the criteria for a good mortgage. By making it standard, it made it into a commodity that could be resold anywhere in America. It enabled investors in New York to be able to invest in Texas or California. Home ownership is the basis of a happy, contented family life. And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, is brought within the reach of all citizens on a monthly payment. The FHA Underwriter's Manual had very explicit criteria for what made for a good investment. So 20%, for instance, of whether a mortgage should be approved or not depended on whether or not there was class and race mixing in a neighborhood. And so if there were restrictive deeds to keep out Jews, Asians, and most importantly, African Americans, it was considered a good investment. Under these roofs, Americans can live as Americans should. These pleasant, helpful surroundings provide the background that young Americans need and deserve. Through this policy, there was the co-creation of both the ghetto and the suburb. And the consequence was that mortgage capital flooded from basically New York City into suburbs around the country. Um, it made it very difficult for people who lived in the city, particularly areas that were multiracial or multi-ethnic, to get mortgage loans. And over time, over 30, 40 years, um, those kinds of markets in the housing deteriorated. And it helped bring about what we see as the urban crisis. Um, Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn in New York City. There are something like 2.3, 2.4 million people living just in Brooklyn alone. This is a very vibrant community. Uh, there's a, a lot of immigrants who live here and a lot of old time uh, New Yorkers, Brooklynites, families that have lived here through the generations. The work that I do, um, I started doing it in the early 1990s, and the work was about getting access to loans in neighborhoods that had been historically redlined, which means they were cut off from access to banking services, bank branches either weren't there or long abandoned the community. So we were working with community groups to try to get banks to make loans in neighborhoods that have been cut off from financial services. By the mid-1990s, the picture was just changing right in front of us because these same neighborhoods were suddenly flooded with credit. Consumer finance companies and, and other lenders had realized that there was a lot of money to be made by making mortgages in neighborhoods that had been cut off from mainstream banking. So much money was being made 
during the 80s and 90s that investors had to put it somewhere. And not just money being made in the United States, but all over the world. I mean, with oil, you know, with the rise of uh, China, there's a lot of money that's sloshing around the world. Capitalism works. And it's because capitalism works that there's more money to invest than ever before. So people began to invest a lot in mortgages. Dynamic Credit's a specialist investment manager. We manage portfolios of financial products called mortgage securities. It, it really began in the late 1980s. Banks who made mortgage loans didn't want to sit and hold those mortgage loans for their full term. Whether they were 10-year, 15-year, or 30-year loans, they were clogging up the capacity of the bank. You'd lend out the money, and it would take all that time to get it back in. You were far better off originating the mortgage and selling it off. The origins of securitization were to take those mortgages on a pooled basis and form CDOs out of them, collateralized debt obligations. So CDO is, is that kind of agglomeration of, of, um, of mortgage-backed securities that can be sold into the capital markets. Have you guys heard of a toxic asset, about toxic asset, yeah? I'm gonna show you guys what a toxic asset looks like. I'm gonna let you guys touch and feel this toxic asset. Be careful when you handle this because it's toxic, right? So this is a, this is a uh, first page of a legal document of a CDO, collateralized debt obligation. The actual document itself is an inch thick. What it does, it tells you how the CDO works. You basically take a pool of any regular cash producing instruments, like a mortgage, credit card, corporate loans. You pull it together, you tranche it up, layer it in risk, in different risk layers, and then you sell that to investors around the world, okay? That's essentially what a CDO is. It's sort of like a Frankenstein sort of security. That's what it is. There are a lot of attractions to doing CDOs on the money management side. You get paid anywhere from one-tenth of one percent per annum on the balance on multiple billions of dollars, which could mean a couple million dollars a year of fees, to a half a percent per annum on a couple hundred million, perhaps corporate credit portfolio, which again could mean a couple million dollars a year of fees. And the best part of it was most of the work went into selecting the portfolio on day one, and then you were paid over years of time for, I'd say, doing a little bit more than babysitting. I would start with a, a nice, clean portfolio of AAA, AA, and some, perhaps some single-A mortgage-backed securities. But I'd have to add something else, what we call juice. It's, it, it's an extra element of risk, which would pay a higher yield. At the time, there was a lot of talk about liar's loans. The, kind of loan that Patty and I got was one step further down on the credibility ladder, which was called a no-ratio loan, in which I literally didn't disclose my income. The house cost $460,000, which even to me was, at that time, was a, an astounding amount of money. The problem that I had was huge child support payments to my ex-wife, as well as alimony. So I was paying out about $4,000 a month, out of, which is well over half of my take-home pay, well over half of my take-home pay. Mm, that's disappointing. Oh, not necessarily. Let that be our problem. Borrowing the money, even under my circumstances, was the easiest thing in the world. The only thing that Leonard knew, the only thing that they wanted to know, was that I had a credit rating of over 700, uh, that the house had been appraised and, you know, was worth what uh, the purchase price was. Um, and that I had a job. They did confirm I had a job, but they didn't try to confirm what the income would be. Well, <laughs> what are we waiting for? 
for me, it wasn't at all a financial investment. I had no expectation that I was going to make a bundle of money on the rising value of the house. It's a hormonal thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a, an, a cornerstone to keeping your family together. Um, it's a, it's a ticket to you know continued membership in the middle class. You know, here I had been through this you know kind of traumatic, dramatic, you know, divorce and remarriage. This was normalcy again. I could still be a normal guy. I used to have my own optical store. I needed financial help. So I went to the bank and I found out that each time I was talking with some financial people, they was asking me if I, has a, if I have a house. And they did explain to me that if I have a house, I will have, I will, it will be like a collateral. So after I closed my business, I told me my new adventure would be to get myself a house. And then for my house, I can get myself another business. So we came here and I liked the house. He told me the house was six seventy nine, six hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars. Six hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars. I tried to get some other real estate, but in this neighborhood, the price is about the same. But he told me, you know what? It's a two family house too. You can rent the other part and you can do the, the basement. They told me you're going to pay about like $4,000 a month. I said, listen, $4,000 is a very expensive. They told me, don't worry about it. After a year, you can refinance. When you refinance, you can get the mortgage go lower. So don't worry, it's going to be just for one year. So we're going to... Um just do some quick announcements and then turn it over to Herman. We've gotten quite a number of folks calling us for foreclosure assistance. Um, I don't know if you want to highlight what's been going on. We got with our four Gap loan last week. I mean, there are just a bunch of homeowners who are in loans that were much too expensive for them. The majority of the loans that were generated and then sold to Wall Street to be securitized were refinance loans. And they weren't good... adding to home ownership. They were taking away and they were de de uh, deteriorating home ownership. Right, I was just going to say, I mean, according to the Federal Reserve, it's something like 77% of the subprime loans made were refinancing loans. So they were loans made to people who also, to add what Josh was saying, had built up a lot of equity in their homes. So they had a lot of wealth that they'd build up. And there were lenders who, uh, and, and brokers and contractors who were all working together um, to try and get people into loans. Um, without any regard to whether they were affordable, because they knew that they could turn around and sell them the next day. To, to Wall Street investment banks at a premium and make a profit, and they knew that they could charge high fees up front. Every time the loan is refinanced, the borrower, and this is why what the incentive is for the broker and the lender to keep flipping the loans, is that they're charging more upfront points and fees. And what that does is it strips out the equity each time more and more. If you look at the deed records for neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods of color in New York City, where there's a high rate of home ownership, you'll see so many homes where people were refinanced over and over and over and over, you know, several times in one year sometimes until their equity is gone and they lose the house. The banks were interested in maximizing transaction costs. One could understand that's capitalism that maximized their profits, but they were doing it at the expense of the poorest Americans. There were attempts to try to stop this. It was clear that it was predatory lending. But they fought back. They stopped the legislation that was moving forward to stop the predatory lending. I've seen this. I've seen the kind of lending uh, patterns. I've seen what they've done to some of these poor people. Let me tell you. Uh, it is outrageous. If you are asking me, who do I blame for my own mortgage woes, I will tell you absolutely certainly, I blame myself and I don't put the blame on anybody else. I knew exactly what I was getting into and uh, 
I knew better, actually, than most other borrowers. We began to struggle very quickly. We ran through what little extra cash cushion I had left in my savings. Then we were borrowing. I hate this. And we were borrowing more than we realized through our credit cards to keep ourselves afloat. But you know, sometimes these things work. We were borrowing on average an extra $2,000 a month. But where would this go then? A staggering amount of money. And the interest rates on that money were just through the roof. And I was trying to figure out what in God's name to do. And uh, that's when I called my, my friendly mortgage broker and started wailing about my problems. Oh, excuse me. Chandler speaking. He said, look, I'll, I'll figure a way out of this. And, and indeed he did. Oh, oh, put him on. The value of the house had gone up about 10% over those two years. Yes, sir. And we ended up boosting the amount we had borrowed, another $50,000. I thought you would. The, the theory of the whole maneuver was if I um, borrow more against the house and pay off my credit cards, my credit scores automatically go up, even though the total volume of debt is exactly as high, maybe a little higher than it was before. Um, and because I've got those higher credit scores, now I can get a slightly cheaper loan. Go figure. It makes no sense at all. You have to be pulling the wool over, wool over your eyes aggressively to believe this kind of stuff. Now we are beginning to see something of what a mortgage banker really does. The full and active life he leads. Much of it behind the scenes for the betterment of the community. The reason why the money, this capital, gets allocated into consumer debt and gets allocated into mortgage debt is because it actually pays, has a better return than investing it in businesses, than investing it in factories or things that make things. Um, and it's this simple, banal calculation that's behind all of this. It's not some greedy Wall Street banker. Wall Street bankers and all capitalists are always greedy. That's the basis of our entire system. It's that the opportunities for investment are different than they used to be and that a dollar put into credit card debt or into mortgage debt makes you more than a dollar put into a factory. around here had sprung up within the last five years. Um, like this building over here, they're still building, even though there's close to 20,000 units that are either available or are gonna be available in a very short period of time. And this one just sprung up not too long ago as well. I think that there's 400 units and there's 50 people in it right now, so it uh, makes for a lonely existence. In some buildings, they're empty. But what happens is that these banks, uh, you know, they get the financing to build these buildings and, you know, they, they have to keep building. Started the mortgage business in 2001 and started in Miami and um, started working for this company, AmeriQuest Mortgage. Last year as a branch manager, I made uh, a little under a million dollars. 930-something thousand. And um, most of the work that I did was refinance. 60% of it was for debt consolidation and the other 30, 40% was cash out. We felt like we were helping people, you know. We'd walk into our office and there was baskets of flowers and fruit from people that we refinanced that weren't able to refinance and we, you know, we got them alone and now they were saving four or five hundred dollars a month or, you know, we pulled their house out of foreclosure. Um, it was a lot of that we did. So how could that not make you feel good? At the time, it seemed like win-win for everybody. It's wonderful, it turns out, that while incomes were falling, house prices were rising. 
as the housing assets grew and their wages remained stagnant, people would borrow money from their houses to make up the gap in their wages. This fall in the share of the bottom 90% represents a transfer upwards of roughly one and a half trillion dollars each year to the top one percent. This enormous upwards redistribution of American income took place in a stable democracy with governments that were promoting this upwards redistribution being re-elected time and time again. It's a very interesting question of how was the American elite able to get away with it? When we were doing refinancing, it was very common to see people with twenty dollars and $30,000 worth of credit card debt. Holy smokes! We've masked a lack of income growth by the fact that people have been supporting their living standards with more debt. So what they were doing is they now had all this equity in the properties. So a lot of people um, refinanced to get rid of that debt, to consolidate the debt. We had, in one year alone, over $900 billion in what are called mortgage equity withdrawal, much of that money going into consumption. So you have roughly one and a half trillion a year going up, and roughly one trillion a year coming down in the form of house equity refinancing. If the American population had been uh, receiving something like their the same income share as in the 1950s and 60s, then they would have been able to increase their consumption in a sustainable way out of rising income. But that's not what happened. The fatal flaw was the assumption that real estate values would always go up. And I think even a fourth grader would be able to tell you that's impossible, it can't happen, that's contrary to the laws of physics, it's contrary to history. And yet somehow everyone literally bought into that. The problem started after a year. So when I called them, they said, no, you cannot refinance because the value of the house went down. That now I started having a hear from Bell. Panic. I said, and she told me, you know what? You can do a loan modification. Okay? I said, okay, fine. If I can do a loan modification, what is a loan modification? I said, okay, that way we're going to go over your loan and lower your, your interest and give you something that you can afford. I said, okay, perfect. They answered me back. They told me that my loan modification was denied. I said, why? They said, because you've been paying your mortgage on time. You, you've never been late. So it means that you have no hardship. Don't pay your mortgage. Don't pay for two or three months. And then you apply for other call it the loan modification. And then we'll be able to give the loan modification. I said, okay, fine. So I take three, three months. I didn't pay. And... I send, I fill out the paper again. And guess what? They deny it. Tampa, St. Petersburg, uh, New Orleans, Kenner, uh, Mansfield, Ohio, Phoenix, Mesa, Scottsdale, San Jose, Sunnyvale. Fresno, Columbus, Ohio, Poughkeepsie, um, New York, Michigan City, Port, Indiana, New York, New Jersey, San Francisco, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Portland, Vancouver, Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, Tampa, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Riverside, New York, Cleveland, Boise City, San Diego, Carlsbad. Each one of these is a, is a mortgage that is part of a particular pool for which we have an exposure to, or in this particular case, we've done an analysis for. 
for a looking history of a borrower. And so what you see is, is this delinquency history for 12 periods. And so there's C for current, there's three for 30 days, there's six for 60 days, and then nine is for 90 days or more delinquent. Then you've got FC, which means you, the process of foreclosure has been started. And then you have ARIA, which means the process of foreclosure was completed. So C is good. You want to see long lists of C. You want to see everybody that looks like that. Where it gets bad is when you look at situations like this, where you went foreclosure, REO, and then the bank finally discharged to the home, but they took a $193,000 loss in this, this home. And, and so interesting things are, you look at present status, nine, but they started out current, and then they went through five periods of, of, of current, and then they got 30 days delinquent, then they, they basically fought back to current. It appears that they, they, they've survived some event. And then they just went down the slippery slope and this time they've turned the corner. Once you're 90 days delinquent, it's really tough to get back. It's, it's kind of a dark world because you, you see it happen and it's somebody's life. As Americans, you've been taught um, this is one of your major stores of value. And in a situation where, you know, wages are not rising in America, this has been one of the major methods for people to ultimately in increase their income in the middle class is through this house appreciation uh, factor. But now that that's gone, it's, it's, it's a devastating reality. And so you're seeing this, this ripple through the economy. It's a myth that, that people didn't see this crisis coming. There was a lot of chatter in the industry. Despite the Dow hitting a three-month high, more and more analysts are cautioning that a recession could be just around the corner. Well, things started to go wrong in the, um, the fall of 2006. In all these years that we've been running these trade deficits, the wealth of the average American household has been going up. No, it has The so-called smart money people uh, you know, the definition of being a smart money kind of person or player is that you know when to get out. And so they all thought they knew when to get out. Sophisticated investors would negotiate for better protections. They'd say, well, I need more protection against potential defaults in the portfolio. So they'd get an extra 1% protection. But 1% extra protection was like saying to somebody, um, you know, I'm going to give you an extra life vest uh, to, to wear on the Titanic. When, when you see the stock market come down and the real estate bubble burst, all that phony wealth is going to evaporate. And all well, that's going to be left is all the debt. My safety valve in my mind when I did this, again, no one put a gun to my head, but I always thought if the market starts to turn, I'll sell. This is an economy that's driven by good economic policies, by good monetary policy, by good trade policy, and it's working beautifully. You started having borrowers not paying in the first month, the second month, the third month, and this wave of mortgages coming back to the originators. It's Art. a zero-sum game. Every Art. interest dollar paid is interest dollar earned. Art. The, people that, Art, the people that earn the dollars are in China. What triggered it was an abrupt uh, lowering of ratings on hundreds of subprime mortgage-backed securities. And that, that struck a huge panic into the whole structural products market. Investors suddenly knew that the game was up. Uh, it wasn't that they were surprised that the downgrades had happened, but they now knew that that all of the other securities couldn't hold up either. And, uh, and, and knowing that, they bailed out very, very quickly. Oh yeah, we were surprised at how fast uh, the devastation took place. There was no time to sell. Once there's blood in the water, everybody's running, and there was just no way out. The crisis came on us rather fast, and it took fast action. I think that the government had to prevent a collapse of confidence. The whole system was predicated on there being a complete gap 
between the people on the ground making the loans and the people packaging them to sell them off as you know through the securitization process on Wall Street so that you can have people sitting in their high-rise building on Wall Street or wherever they were in their fancy offices having no connection whatsoever and no regard and not even in their imagination thinking about what this commodity was that they were bundling and selling off they were completely severed and that was why this was able to go for so long because one would hope there would be some people within that machinery that had some conscience and that if they understood what they were packaging was actually translating very concretely into loans that were, let's just be blunt, ruining people's lives. I mean, wiping out people's life savings, stealing their equity, making people homeless, wrecking families. I mean, the devastation can't really be overstated what it means to sort of be kind of induced into a loan that then spins out of control and leaves you without your home. Uh, do I feel any responsibility? I, I think responsibility is is um, a, a difficult feeling for people in the sense that all their their most people's participation, other than a, a select few, which had very very important jobs, probably head of the rating agencies, some chief regulators, a couple chief bankers, etc. Most of the other participants in the system, I think, kind of felt like cogs in the wheel of a much larger piece of machinery. Mr. Chairman, I know I agree with you in the fact that there were a lot of people who raised issues about problems emerging, but there are always a lot of people raising issues, and uh, half the time they're wrong. And the question is, uh, what do you do? I mean, you point out quite correctly that the Federal Reserve had as good an economic organization has exists in, I would say, in the world. If all those extraordinarily capable people were unable to foresee the development of this critical problem, I, have to th I think we have to ask ourselves, why is that? And the answer is that uh, we're not smart enough. My aunt had a riding stables in the Midwest, and uh, every summer I'd go out there and, and work for her, so. Go on, girl. She died 12, 14 years ago, and there were 50 horses to dispose of, so I thought, well, I have the land now, maybe I should get horses. So that's what happened. Good girl. I owe a lot more on this place than it's worth, so hopefully it'll all work out and I can hang on to it, but. That's still to be determined. My situation right now is I'm waiting for a loan modification. I need a loan modification. My only way out is a loan modification. I don't want to live free. I know I have to pay my mortgage. I'm going to pay my mortgage. It would be a shame if I cannot hang up to my house. It would be a shame. It will be, I don't want to think about that because it's, I don't think it's right because I can pay for it. All I'm asking is the loan modification, okay? It's the, the house, the value of the house was too high. The, uh, the kind of mortgage I got was a bad mortgage. So why they cannot re redo my mortgage for me? Why are they going to want me to lose my, my house? What are they going to do with it? To have you know, achieved a measure of respect in your life, worked hard to become a, you know, correspondent in Washington at a famous newspaper, and, uh, you know, kind of been, a, in a way, a part of the establishment, and to now, you know, ha see yourself plunged down to uh, being, you know, a debtor, the likes of which are being made fun of all over the place, just an awful experience. It, it was the kind of thing where you find out you're not as strong as you thought, you're, you're a whole lot more foolish than you thought, and furthermore, you've lost 
maybe almost everything that you had in terms of your financial assets and maybe even in terms of your marriage. It doesn't get much worse than that. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining me today. On this tour, I gave you guys a lot of information. I want to give you guys a few uh, takeaways, key takeaways. People, when they talk about the financial crisis, they talk about the regulation of financial institutions. They talk about evil people lending money when they shouldn't, taking, taking advantage of people, predatory lending. But I think all those things pale before the real crisis, which is the way in which uh, capital moves in the economy and the way in which wage inequality has caused this capital to move so inefficiently in our economy. What we are doing, in effect, is transferring money from people who would spend it to people who don't need all that money and don't spend it. Uh, record bonuses, uh, you know, hundreds of people getting more than a million dollars a year, even when the company makes a loss. Uh, so, uh, the problem is that when you have growing inequality, typically your level of consumption goes down. In the United States, we said to those whose income was not going anywhere, we said, don't worry, continue to spend as if your income was going up. But that the only way you do that is through debt. But that particular model has been broken. We need to be have capitalism work for us, not work us over. This is the real difference, right? We need to figure out a way to make profits create jobs, not for everybody, not profits create just some wealth for the very few. If that's the case, then capitalism will no longer work because people will not stand for it. And what's made capitalism great for the last 500 years is that it's actually created better standards of living for everyone. The capitalism in the last 30 years has decreased the standard of living for everyone except those at the very top. Jack built his house on sand. It sure looks good on paper. Jack's a fortunate man. Let's build a house like that so we can be just like Jack. Just like Jack But when the sand begins to blow away The way that sand does We gather round and say That's where the house